Welcome, everybody, to the 3DMs Podcast. We are on episode 40. Uh, and finally, I have another person other than Paul in studio with me, but we still haven't hit our third host quota for, what Too is it, long. the 13th episode? Yeah, 13th episode in a row. We were actually going to get Clint back today. It was going to be the amazing return of Clint to the show, but he started puking this morning. His tummy doesn't feel good. Yeah, he wouldn't even let us rub his belly. I know. Poor little guy. Anyways, Nacho is back from uh, Michigan State University. Uh, Nacho, fill us in on your time away from the show, just so our small but dedicated fan base can know how you've been. Uh, pretty much. Mostly all I do is classes, try to take a nap, go work as a bouncer, try to get all my homework done, try to take a nap, go to class. Okay. No, just living the dream. Yeah, living the dream. You uh, run any more games for the frat boys? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, you need to get back on that. Yeah, no, uh, they all graduated and left, the ones that I was playing with. Well, you need to, you need to get a new crop. You've got until May. You've got a nice young batch of talent that you need to introduce to the wonderful world of Dungeons and Dragons. And I want to see if they get into worse shenanigans than, uh, trying to become drug kingpins like your last party did. Yeah, no, I've tried, but unfortunately, they're all a bunch of nerds. They're too busy focusing on girls, parties, and sports. That that does it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, going forward. Uh, so, last week's show, we talked about Warlock patrons and how, as a DM, you need to facilitate. There's a lot of stuff you need to facilitate for a Warlock. This week, we're going to stay in that vein, talking about... Uh, clerics, your god pantheon, uh, you know, how your pantheon and your universe is going to work and function if you're going to make your own, and how holidays and festivals can work. So let's launch right into this bad Jackson. Let's do it. When you sit down and you take out, you say to yourself, you know, I'm just going to make my own setting because it takes too much reading and too much research to know everything that you need to know about these other settings. Or maybe you just, you know, feel that creative spirit and you want to launch in your setting, you immediately realize that there's about 10,000 things that you need to become responsible for and create. And one of those things at the very top of the list is a pantheon of gods. So if you want to save time, and it's completely understandable if you do, because sitting down and creating your own pantheon is a, a bit of a involved project. You've got to come up with a lot of lore on your own. Uh, the in the back of the player's handbook, they have the Forgotten Realms. They've got Greyhawk. They've got Dragonlance, Eberron, and various non-human deities all assorted. They tell you their symbols, their domains, and using the power of Google, you can easily learn everything you need to know about religious observances, backstories, uh, especially for the Forgotten Realm stuff. All that's a lot of that is in the Sword Coast Adventurers Guide the most underappreciated book in existence. Here, I've got the skag. Let's see what other stuff they have in there, if I can find they've it. Got, they've got a nice, lovely, detailed uh, thing. It's going to be on the other direction. Oh, it's at the beginning. And, yeah, it's at the beginning. They've got a uh, couple of paragraphs on every single god, and that is over 20. I'm not going to sit here and count them out on air. That just sounds time-consuming. But you want to sit down. You want to make your own you know, your own gods. All right. Well, let's launch right into that. So classic mythology uh, is going to be your strongest influence. Uh, look at your influence from Greeks. Look at your influence from the Norse, from the various other pantheons that you might want to look at. You know, we got Irish mythology. We got Egyptian mythology, Japanese mythology, Hindu mythology. They're 
there's got Wicca. There's four thousand different religions on the planet. If you can't find, then you have your Mesopotamian gods. <laughs> do you want to? Do we want to go all the way back to Babylon? You know, it's Spring Gilgamesh. Yeah, it's you have so many options to look at for gods. It, it, we're not going to sit here and just get into a mythological debate. But what we are going to look at is what a typical pantheon consists of. So, standard pantheon, as we sat down and said, well, what are there typically gods of? And there's usually a lot of different gods. Uh, War, death, love. There's the god of the sun, praise the sun. Music, law, wine, nature, the ocean slash water, sky. There's the trickster god there's always a knowledge god there's a god of magic typically because this is dungeons and dragons you have the burninator fire god there's a burninating fire god trying to burn down yeah trying to burn down the countryside we got the god of the forge or building or crafting or however you want to explain that sometimes there's gods of stars your merchant god or wealth god yeah there's a god of money there's a there's more gods again than you can can name it there can be a god exactly so what you want to do when you sit down Think about your setting, you know, uh, recommending in the world. If you go back to about episode 10, I believe, I'm, I'd have to double check. I should have put that in my notes. Yeah, no, we probably should have looked. Probably should have looked. At some point early on. But whatever. If you go back and you look in, at our world building suite, we kind of talk about a order of things to do. I recommend you make your map first. You establish where your major cities are. About eight cities is usually a good round number. And from there, you're going to look at what gods you want and how they function in your world. Uh, this is going to be a very just brief expouse, exposing of how kind of do it. Because it's however you want to get there is however you're going to get there. Whatever your influences are and how you want them to be are your own. But just here's more helpful reminders of things to keep in mind. And then also bear in mind, there are multiple ways to get to reach this point, like Jake here, him and Paul, they're both very meticulous with their planning. Me, I go more off the cuff. So generally, when I'm building a Pantheon, it's, you know what, this is going to be important right now. So here, let's quickly flesh this out. And then I'll worry about the other ones as they come. So which don't do it my way. (laughs) It's no that I've actually had to just as a as a response to that, I've had to do that. Uh, in the past, I've had various people take a look at, uh, you know, like my landscape or whatever, and they ask to worship a god or something that I just don't have canned. I don't have pre-prepared, but it's a good enough idea that I'm like, well, why don't you tell me what the god of the woodland spirits would do? And then what do they look like and what's their name and uh, how do you worship them and what's uh, all the rituals and observances that you have to do? Oh, God, you're worse than me. I know, right? You don't even do your own off the cuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I let them come up with it because then they feel like they're more invested in the world. Work smarter, not harder, Nacho. Smarter, not harder. But there's a lot of things to consider. Uh you look at your pantheon, you figure out how many gods you're going to have. Uh, a nice round number like seven is cute sometimes. Or you can have like, I don't know, damn near 40. Like, uh, Here, let, let's pull up one of the uh, skag ones. This pantheon. There's a lot of fun ones like the, Tears. The, the Ferunian tears cool. pantheon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, I'm at 15. I'm done. Yeah. There's there's plenty of gods, and that's not even diving into, uh, if you look in the 5th edition book that has all this is, wow, come on, come on, Mordenkainen's. In, uh, in the Tome of Foes, there is also the pantheons for the elves, the dwarves, the halflings, the gnomes. Oh, Sword Coast has that. Yeah, Sword Coast has that too as a list, but uh, like all the lore and information on them is there as well. There's Yeah, there's probably over 40 gods, which... In my opinion is that's a bit much. I don't know. I was at 15 before starting H. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have some hefty lists. But when it comes to making your own pantheon, here's what you got to do. Examine the role that the gods play in your world. Are your gods very hands-on or are they very hands-off? Do they only interact really with their clerics and priests or do they interact more with the world as a whole like you know if you're walking around and you're like hey 
That mountain over there, that's a new mountain. Well, yeah, because the god of mountains decided he wanted to make a new one, goddammit. It's his prerogative to make mountains because guess what? It's his fucking job title that he is the god of mountains. Are they hands-on? Do they do crazy things? Is it like... Is it like in Greek mythology where either Zeus's penis, uh, Poseidon just being very, very sultry, or Hades just being non-confrontational is causing a lot of problems? Yeah, and it's like here we have the god of podcasts sitting here doing all our tech support for us <laughs> and letting us in the studio. Smooth. Um, examine how you want your gods to function in your world. Uh, make sure that whatever route you stick to just keep a heavy hand on it if you have gods like say thor who just show up every now and again and beat up giants and then you know okay i'm off back to asgard bye bye keep that consistent make sure that the tales and the stories being told by the common folk uh, yeah the giants i'm going to use a minnesota an accent oh, for this do it. but yeah so the giants were attacking and we were hiding in the basement and we thought all the doom was coming and we heard the thunder and then there he is the son of the all father smacking giants with the hammer it was beautiful and then I asked my wife if we wanted to get it done, but she said there was just no way. And that's a Family Guy joke. Keep it consistent with your players and your world setting if the gods involve themselves or they don't. And if they suddenly, if there's a shift, if the gods are uh, involving themselves very, very suddenly, you know, th this is something that hasn't happened for, you know, millennia, 500 years, or, you know, whatever time stamp you want to put on it. Make sure that their involvement is for a reason that you have, you know, ready, written, prepared. Um, Whenever the Tarrasque awakes from its slumber, that's a pretty good time for the gods to come to Earth. Yeah, yeah. Thor showing up when the Tarrasque wakes up from its nap is a pretty good time for, you know, the son of Odin to show up and start slapping things. Uh couple uh, little just interesting tidbits, and then we're going to get into the meat of today's show, which is actually to deal with clerics. A couple of side things for everyone to consider with their Pantheon. Um, for one, there is, and this is something I don't see a lot of DMs do, and this is something I actually only kind of realized myself about a year ago, and that is the following. So we're used to all of our standard array of player character races are humanoid races uh you know so humans elves dwarves orcs halflings go uh halflings goblins gnolls uh who am i forgetting gnolls half orcs half elves the the shebang dragon there, there's a lot yeah dragonborn yeah yeah tabaxi yahab goblins yahab goblins okay so sticking to just the player races, we all know that they, you know, worship the major gods and then maybe gods more specific to their own race. But what gods do the giants worship? What gods do uh, they actually cover orc gods? So in Volos, but what gods, what major religious figures do they follow? Do they follow the same mainstream Religion. If you're creating a religious system and you've only got, say, 10 gods, then I'm pretty sure the god of war or the god of strength is really going to... I'm, I'm using giants here as just kind of an off-the-cuff example, but the god of strength and the god of war is actually really going to appreciate giants who run around and, you know, break shit and... Toss trees. And toss trees at an Olympic level because, you know, they're giants. Try to consider and again this is all just you know little notes to keep in your head how gods are going to feel about certain races what certain races are doing i feel like the god of knowledge isn't exactly going to like the hill or the stone giants but is going to be very very fond of the your gnomes. of your storm giants your cloud giants but also the gnomes and as we move into a more esoteric version of this conversation uh Try to consider how that would shape relationships, because actually the gnomes is a very good example. Because I could see hill giants and stone giants being... Stone giants aren't dumb, but hill giants are dumb. Um, I could see them going after, say, a gnomish population settlement. Whether it's intentional or accidentally stepping on them. Yes, and causing a lot of havoc there. But that would be the relationship they have. But if the gnomes worship a god of knowledge or a god of magic or something, you know, in between, 
and also the Storm Giants do, and the Storm Giants control the Ordning. If you don't know what the Ordning is, that is uh, the most superior Giants control all Giants, so Storm at the top, and then we go Cloud, Frost, Fire, Stone, and Hill. That's, I think I'm remembering it right. Storm Giants are in charge, so do Storm Giants grant protection to the Gnomes because they have the same god? They, you know, and they worship at the same level? Or is it one of those... Uh, nasty Abrahamic religion kind of things where it's like, well, we believe in the same God, but we don't take the same road to get there. So go, you know, kick your own ass. Like, for example, in real life, you have Baptists and Catholics, for example, worship the same God, have a lot of similarities, but... Because it doesn't have... It's because it's Coke instead of Pepsi. Yeah. They don't get, a, they don't get along. It's... Something to consider just the various relationships that various groups would have, because as a parallel to the real world, when you take a look at how uh, a lot of communities are formed and how a lot of uh, just even places are built, it's usually based on religion and the relationship that they have with other cultures often in the past came down to religion. We're living in a now kind of a weird time where suddenly we're all starting to eschew religion a little bit more and we're all trying to uh come together as the song says but definitely for the majority of human history it's been based on beliefs uh religious systems and you know there's usually some xenophobia in there so trying to figure out how everybody is going to mesh based on their beliefs is going to give you a richer much more lived in feeling for your setting because not everybody's going to be sitting around the fire singing kumbaya and you know we can we all forgot our difference you know, it, the world's a nasty place. But it'd still be nice to have some gnomes sitting on a storm giant's shoulder slinging spells. Yeah, because, you know, they worship the same god. So just try to find relationships that you can make work. Uh, you can find relationships that will work based on religions that can add some very interesting dynamics to your setting. Uh, just simply on who believes in what. But let's get into the meat of today's show. And we're going to touch back on a little bit of that stuff. Uh, but we're going to get into today, today's meat, which is clerics and how you interact with them as a DM. So when a player comes to you and they say, well, Dad. Yes, son. I'd like to play a cleric. Well, uh, you see here, <laughs> pick a god. Yeah. Your work is immediately, like we said before with the warlock, uh, very cut out for you. Where the guy who plays the fighter is just, cool, tell me how uh, how much ass you used to kick before you became a player character and we're good to go. We're now more onto a setting of, I have to figure out what god you worship, how you got to the point of getting your powers. Uh, tenants of said god. Tenants of said god, how do you observe said tenants. Um, and we're going to go from the top. So... Let's just pick a god that I'm very is very near and dear to my heart from the pantheon of D and D gods. Helm, Pelor, close, not really. Yeah, not way off. <laughs> Samson, you were way off. Uh, Pelor, god of the sun, yeah, was but... the uh, my paladin. The very first character I ever played uh, was the god my palad paladin worshipped was Pelor, and that's. So everything, I like went online, I read as much as I could on the God of the Sun, uh, the worship and stuff, because I really felt it would add to the character, uh, knowing my religious observances and how I felt about things, and so on and so forth. So when your player sits down and they say, well, I would like to play a Grave Domain Cleric, and what would be my best option for that? You know, assuming you're using your own Pantheon and you're not using just a pantheon that uh you picked from one of the other systems then you have to figure out okay well the grave domain specializes in taking things that were dead and then woke up and making sure that they go back to being dead like the whole time so what god actually actively opposes undeath i know for me in my setting that god is nazgul nazgul is the god of dead god of the dead and the god of you know like he's the reaper he is the one who does the reaping and he gets really 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 fussy when uh the things that he you know came to collect suddenly start getting up and walking around okay so then i have to look at my setting cool where are these temples where do they train these special uh you know walking dead where do, where do they train the army of daryl dixons to go out into the world and make sure that the dead stay dead 
I now have all that work to do for this player. So likewise, when a player selects a cleric and you don't necessarily have something ready, um, you can sometimes do, like I said before, and work backwards. Find out what domain they want to play. Okay, you want to play a trickster domain. Well, let's say you don't have a trickster god. Because okay. for whatever reason, you can't think of Loki. Yeah. Well, because Loki, I mean... He's overused, but he's, he's overused. always there. My, my personal favorite is Coyote from uh, Native American mythology. Uh, he's in several different variants of Native American mythology. But long story short, this is how every Coyote story goes. Hey, I'm going to do this thing, but I'm going to kind of take a shortcut for it. Oh, God, it blew up in my face. Don't worry, I got away with it. But still, ooh, dicey. Coyote's funny if you... If you're fond of reading mythology at all, uh, the coyote stories from Native American cultures are fantastic. Sorry, I had to refresh. So, when it comes to, you know, let's say this person again picked a trickster god. Okay, you need to make up a trickster god on the spot. Figure out your name. Um, and then having a conversation with the player on how they think religious observances should work. Uh, this is something that I recommend highly as often times when you, you know, you, you don't have the time to sit down and write a 1200 page Bible for your universe. It, you know, I'm, I'm, mine's getting there and I, a lot of it's still in my head, but there's, you know, not as much stuff as I would like to have written down. So when it gets to a point where a player wants to play something and they want to work with something that you don't have figured out, Go to pop culture. That's a decent tip, but I always let them, well, you're now the cleric of... Bugs Bunny. Yeah, Bugs Bunny. Because Paul's not here, and that's going to yeah. peeve him. Yeah, no, uh, Paul absolutely hates us for believing that Bugs Bunny could be an amazing trickster god. No, Bugs Bunny is an amazing trickster god, and Paul just doesn't see it. What's so directly with in Paul not being here, we can say it without... All right, yeah, so no, fight. we're going to use Bugs Bunny. All right, so... <laughs> I, th I thought you were trying to lead into that. This, nope, nope, but uh, here we are. So this player has decided, yes, I would like to worship Bugs, god of foolery and carrots. Master of disguise. Master of disguise. Bamboozler extraordinaire. Gender fluid. Yes, gender fluid. Okay, well, what does the worship of Bugs the Bunny look like? Tormenting hunters. Okay, no, that's actually, and then that and is how we get to the creative process. You actually, play, you play tricks in a way that disrupt people that want to disrupt nature. So, your trickster god could also be like have a domain within nature. Yeah, it could be worshipped by druids, or it would be venerated by druids. Um, so yeah, you you start out with so religious observances. Uh, how do they how do they pay tribute to bugs? These are questions you want to ask your player. Since you're my player in this situation, Nacho, come up with uh, religious observances for bugs. I, I got some stuff in my head, but what do you got? Well, it all starts with tormenting hunters to uh, keep them away from the woods, providing a very large tribute of carrots, and always keeping a doctor nearby. <laughs> What's up, Doc? Or becoming a doctor. <laughs> This is how you pay tribute to Bugs Bunny. You become a doctor. I love it. Uh, okay. So what days of the year is it active just whenever you see people getting ready to go out for hunting? Do you go out and mess with them? Like if you're in a town and, you know, because usually, you know, there are the people who like go and trap squirrels or stuff like that. But usually there's a decent sized hunt going out to try to wrangle up meat for the town. Is that when uh, your trickster cleric weighs... Uh, you know, you kind of tap into those and start messing with stuff. I feel like Bugs Bunny would be all about the fall harvest. Okay. Fall harvest season. And that's, but that is the meat of what we're getting to here. You decide what your God's going to be. You decide, okay, the player's going to go with this. Now, how does a, and these are the litany of questions you have to ask your character because, uh, you know, it's easy for a fighter just to be, oh, I wear, I'm wearing this armor. This is the color of my armor. This is how my sword looks. This is how this looks. Um, but when it comes to clerics, they are 
servants of a particular deity. And as we can just look at the real world, for example, holy men and women of all different religions and uh, various other disciplines always have a different outfit, a different way of speaking, a different way of conducting ceremony. And so now that we have Bugs Bunny as a trickster god... I feel like Bugs Bunny would be a more wear what you feel comfortable in because Bugs Bunny, he's constantly changing outfits. So I feel like he'd appreciate his followers just constantly having a very a very lively repertoire of clothing to wear. Yes. That's actually no, that that makes perfect sense. So, you know, that's how do they dress? How do they address people? How do they gain followers? Or does the God want to gain followers? This is where like and this happened to me I think the second time I ever had a cleric because they wanted to play something I didn't have anything prepared for. And it, not to make a pun here, but there literally was a rabbit hole of just information I had not even thought of. How do they dress? Do they have a specific diet? Assuming, staying on the Bugs Bunny tip, uh, they probably don't eat meat and they definitely don't eat wabbits. Especially not wabbits. Especially not wabbits. Maybe duck. Maybe, I was about to say, maybe duck once a year just to really stick it to... Daffy. Yeah, for uh, the spring equinox, when you're bringing in the new life, you're allowed to have a duck hunt. You're allowed to get one duck. (laughs) Just one duck. But only black mallards. As long as they have a white ring around their neck. (laughs) Um, From there, what's their... Do they have a church? Or is it more you break out the shrine of Bugs Bunny, which I assume is a tiny piano with a sombrero and one carrot. I like the tiny piano idea. Yeah, you know, does the tiny piano get broken out, or do the, is there a church to Mr. Bugs where they speak about the mythical Albuquerque and how that you can never arrive? Dave, you look like you have some input. I'm saying a, a conductor stick should be involved. <laughs> uh, possibly... Um, a headdress uh, with fake long hair. Yeah. Uh, possibly a uh, kill the wabbit chant. <laughs> <laughs> Something involving a spear and magic helmet. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There's umpteen ways to honor Bugs Bunny. Honor Bugs Bunny. And these are things you have to decide for your player. Now, to take it to a much more serious realm, uh, for example, let's come up with a another god. Uh, let's say your player wants to play the fire domain and again this is a good time to you know if you're you have a very new setting letting your players just kind of come up with things that you haven't really worked on is a good way to make the setting feel more lived in so let's go with uh the one we were discussing in the car which is a god of justice slash law um who has instead of what uh, domain that's normally associated with that, which is war or sometimes uh, life. Let's go with light as the domain for justice. Light is, of course, the I burn everything domain. Yeah. You see that sun up there? It's going to get a lot hotter. Yeah. And so how does a religious observance for, mm, I should have come up with a couple of names beforehand. How does this unnamed God of justice also fire? How do they function? How are they looked at in society? Um, let's create a hypothetical here. We have uh, this we have this Bugs Bunny worshipping madman on one hand, and then we've got this person following this unnamed fire god who is all about justice. Elmer's food. No. We've gone too far. We've gone too far, Nacho. We can't go too far down this rabbit hole. Oh, Jesus. I'm getting a long talking to in the car. Yeah, you're going to get a long talking to in the car. Uh <laughs> We have these two, and they enter into town. Um, Considering both are going to have very different reputations, so let's talk about Bugs Bunny. We're going to hop back to Bugs Bunny God for one second. How is a cleric of uh, Bugs the Bunny going to be treated by the townsfolk? I I feel like since he's probably going to be, you know, charting somewhere chaotic good, he's going to be beloved. Um, He's going to do a lot for, you know, the nice folk, the poor folk, uh, is not going to be liked by anybody who is abusing nature, considering that that is 
industrial cities will hate him. Yeah. Anybody. Uh, but the small hamlets, they'll probably enjoy his company. Yeah. So how are the people going to treat him? Are they going to be warm to him? The, you know, the, it seems like there's going to be kind of a folk hero thing where if it's a small town, then, yeah, they're going to bring him into the hearth and, you know, food and food and water and drink and sleep and, you know, all the things you need, you know, treat him as guests. Maybe in a bigger city, though, where they process the lumber and they, you know, have to murder a lot of livestock and they do things that are against uh, Bugs's nature. There might be, there could be legal repercussions for actually worshiping him in a major city. They could have that kill the kill the wabbit mentality. They could have a kill the wabbit mentality. They could actively, if they find out that you worship Bugs the Bunny, then they'll be after you. But on the flip side, um, let's talk about this fire justice god really quick that we got cooking. If Howard, <laughs> I, I did see what you did there. I didn't mean to. I just do this to myself all the time. If we have the fire god, uh, who is also the god of justice then how is he going to be held in the same standards? And this is something to think about when you're doing this. How is he going to be held by the small town, by the large city, by the good people, by the bad people? If you're walking through a part of town that is known for having a high crime rate, for example, is this cleric who's walking around very obviously decked out in the stylings of his god, how is he going to be handled by that area? Are they going to shun him? Are they going to be violent? You know, you came to the wrong neighborhood. Are they going to be are they going to be extra ballsy saying, hey, we haven't been burned up yet. Our God doesn't care. Or are they going to (laughs) hide? Because, you know, depending on how you have this fire, God, you know, is this is this God just a very much a well, you did wrong. So you got to get the burn in Aiton or give you a couple flame lashes. or, Or is this Judge Dredd on fire? Who's just walking around, kicking down doors, snatching people up, and, and lighting their whole house on fire? Lighting their whole house on fire for the simple infraction of doing drugs. Don't do drugs, kids. Don't do drugs, because Judge Dredd will get you. But these are things to consider in how historically, in your setting, all these things are handled. So let's let me get back to my main page here. Do 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 do. So we figured out, you know, or we've discussed certain ways of interacting with your players thus to this point. Um, And another thing that we're going to add, because it's almost Christmas, y'all, when we're recording this. uh, Let's talk about festivals. We're going to shift focus off the cleric for just a second and kind of talk about just a little world building tool. And that is festivals and events. So uh, considering that there is a usually in almost every setting, a impressive amount of divine beings. Most of them have a holy day, and most of them are going to have some form of observance. Uh, To start off, you know, figure out time of year. Uh, Making a calendar is actually one of my favorite things to do whenever I create a new setting or I'm working on some setting stuff is just fiddling with a calendar, figuring out a lunar cycle and solar cycle, and that's always fun. Um... We will post this to after there is a uh, website called Chaotic Shiny that does create uh, randomly generated holidays. Uh, you know, like second full moon of after the spring equinox, you know, after the vernal equinox, things like that. Um, and that's pretty useful if you don't have any ideas. But figuring out your major observances and holy days are going to add a lot to particular sittings. Uh, per- bleh, particular cities and different parts of your setting depending on where you have certain gods being the big chiefs if the god follows let's say our burninating god of justice then that city is probably not going to be a lot of fun to be in um if you're if you're a criminal if you're a criminal everyone else they'll, they'll be celebrating around the uh big ass pyre where all the criminals are getting a mass cremation you know, well, yeah. at the stake. Things to think about too, though, like is has that city gone too far, and they've turned into almost a uh, Orwellian nineteen eighty four esque society where thought crime is a thing, and even thinking about doing something bad has become a thing. And I, I like to think that uh, the fiery judge Dredd is standing there on a on a rooftop, watching with 
a small smirk on his face. <laughs> you know, is is a city that attributes itself to that kind of a god going to be, you know, how is that going to be run? Uh, likewise, we've got our Bugs Bunny example. You know, how is a town that uh, primarily, you know, I, I, I like to see a little hobbit. I, I can visualize kind of like a hobbit glen being very full of people who worship Bugs Bunny. You know, as long as they're not Kender. What's that? Oh, fuck Kender. How's that hobbit hole? But how's that hobbit hole going to look? How's that going to feel and function? And what are their festivals going to look like? So let's talk about a festival for Bugs Bunny thrown by a bunch of hobbits because that actually be sounds like fun. Colorful. They'll have a uh, stick in the middle with a bunch of ribbons and they're running around. Well, so I like to think trying so, to catch fireflies. You know, day one. Oh, Mardi Gras. It's going to look like Mardi Gras. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a. It's a seven day, it's a seven day religious observance, right? Day one uh, is just all going to be uh, gathering carrots. This is, this is the labor part. It's gathering carrots and digging holes, um, in preparation for the games. Day two is um, one person is deemed the hunter, and everybody else is wascally wabbits. And for the rest of the day, they have to pull tricks on the hunter. It is usually the bravest of all of the. Uh, halflings who selects the role of the hunter because they're going to get their asses basically kicked all day with vicious pranks. Uh, day three, there is a bunch of plays and performances enacting various stories about Bugs the Bunny uh, that involve uh, the hair monster, stories of running away from Elmer Fudd, shenanigans with his mortal enemy Daffy the Duck. Then day four, you have the rabbit games where they try to bring all the rabbits in the immediate area, give them carrots and watch them like race around and place bets on them. <laughs> uh, you know, various costume changes, you know, a lot of revelry and fun. This is something that if your players were to show up in this, you know, say they made a little hobbit friend and they were like, the bunnying is coming. The hell's the bunnying? The hoppening. The hoppening. <laughs> uh, this is why I pay you. Um. I yeah, the ho the happening is coming. Uh, <laughs> your players are going to be oh okay. Let's do that. And uh, festival shenanigans are always a lot of fun for your party. So don't be afraid to just kind of have a, you know, an, a session off, so to speak, where instead of everybody running around and progressing the plot and doing serious business, doing serious business, you know, see what kind of shenanigans can just see you what's can make happening. happen. See what kind of shenanigans you can make happen at a festival. Now, let's move on to the other side of that coin, though. Unnamed Judge Dread, Judge Dread Fire God, uh, on his day of holy observance, what happens? Is there a mass parade of criminals who've been waiting execution? Is this a very grim, long day of executions or... Uh, you know, you've had crimes. That, is this like everybody goes to court at the same time? Like, yeah, your court date has been off for six months, and uh, well, here's the holy day. So everybody get up there, go in front of the fiery judge, and see exactly what he's got to say about you. And then you also have the nicer fire god of justice that gives you those little flame lashings, which in comparison is little. I don't. I don't know. In, in comparison, it's little. It, it's still going to hurt like hell, but <laughs> no. perhaps with them, it's, hey, we're having a big fire and people dance around it. But it's sticking to a con very consistent form with that festival is the main ideal we're trying to get across here. With So with the Bugs Bunny one, you know, it's, it's a fun. It's supposed to be a good time for your players. Uh with the other one, you can always, again, impress what a harsh and brutal society this is where, you know, at first they're like, and this man killed 15 people. All right. Yeah, good. Yeah. Burn him at the stake. And this, this person, guy was littering. Yeah, this guy was littering. Wait, why, why are you why are you burning half of his body? Meanwhile, the bard is quietly sneaking away. Yeah, the cra <laughs> the bard is just in the rogue or just like, so we're just going to. You know, just, just slowly back just, up. Everyone just back away slow. Just, just act like they haven't seen us yet. Putting them in positions to make them uncomfortable or to influence player action. 
Um, and then if, for say, this city, village, what have you, is like they're you feel like they've gone corrupt and taken it way too far. You could turn that into a small little uh, side quest where the party's then trying to figure out what happened, perhaps come into contact with that god while taking them down, pretend it's a cult. Yeah. There is a, with the addition of a festival, especially attached to a god that you've created for your setting, uh, you can add a lot of living, breathing, feeling emotion to your game and how your players are going to interact with your world. Again, as we've been kind of stressing for this whole episode. So I advise, again, just to consider, you know, what the kind of feel you're going for your city. It's a great time to introduce a city. It's kind of like when you want to go on vacation. Like, people like to go to New Orleans, but a lot of people go to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. You know, a lot of people head to uh, various cities, depending on big things that are going on. Uh, Me and Nacho are both from Ann Arbor. And we all know that we don't go to Ann Arbor during the art fair because that's when all the out-of-town folk are there. And it's just not a fun time to drive around or be in the city. There's no parking. There's no parking. Half the streets are blocked off. And you have to fight through everybody to get to wherever you're going. For me, it was work. Yeah. (laughs) And so if you're playing in your setting, it's always a very convenient, oh, hey, look at that. You showed up on the third day of, you know, Fantasy Mardi Gras or Fantasy Christmas or Fantasy Thanksgiving or whatever. Or the Dreadening. Or the <laughs> or the Dreadening. God, that would be a horrible city. Just as an aside, that would yeah. be horrible yeah. to show up. Hey, yeah, guys. It's, I'm glad we finally met. Why is there a pyre in the center of town? Oh, yeah, it's the Dreadening. Well, what do you it's mean? day three. Like, this is when shit really gets going. <laughs> but what do you mean by shit really gets going? Oh, yeah, no, they're just... Uh, they're- so you see that corral of people over there yeah they're gonna be here and then they're gonna be ash what'd they do uh well that guy didn't pay a parking ticket for how long five months we have the lowest crime rate in the realm that guy chopped down a tree without a permit <laughs> almost got jake to tro- choke on his drink almost <laughs> play with the idea of gods associated festivals and using it to really set a a template for your setting uh and remember we are making extremes here yeah we are uh but it's you know just try to color within the lines of those too and play with it figure out what works for you for your setting and what you think is going to make a compelling session for your players um now this is more advice to anybody who's already somehow sat through all this and said, well, I've already done all this, Jake. What else you got for me? Uh, I was ready for you, Chiefy. You one person. And that is the talking of changing traditions. So over time, holidays evolve and become very different things. Um, Even in my lifetime of 27 years, Christmas has gone from being one thing to being a very different thing. There's a very different feel for the season. It used to be a day, then a week now a month or then a month now late october through january yeah no people talk about the war on christmas i talk about the war of christmas on everything else because god damn it like it's it's there way too soon but the I, point I, is i honestly did play a christmas song right after halloween so geez. i'm one of those people oh you are getting a tongue lashing in the car um i haven't even decorated my tree yet i got two days i got lights on it and i'm just like we'll put a bulb on there well, I slipped the DJ a $5 bill to give me a shout-out and play All I Want for Christmas at 12.05, going, 12.05 a.m. going into November 1st. So I was sitting at the door, All I Want for Christmas comes on. I got a good laugh. I hate And it you. brightened my night. Well, I'm glad it made you happy. I'm pretty sure it ruined a lot of nights. The point is, holiday, efficient, holiday traditions evolve. They change. And be cognizant of how that might have happened in your setting. Another good example of a real-life holiday that has really changed in the last decade or two um, is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving used to be 
there was a lot of <laughs> very awkward um, paying thanks and handshaking and waving to Native Americans for helping us through our first winter when we got to America. I heard that all the way up until I was about 15 years old. And then it stopped really quick because the narrative had shifted to, oh, yeah, we did. We're kind of throwing them a party after we took everything from them. And it's now moved on to the eat turkey, watch football, drink beer kind of a narrative. Halloween has changed in the last 30 years from being a, you know. Um, this is for small kids to. This is for small kids to now. Everybody besides middle schoolers. Every. <laughs> no, it's it's pretty much everybody. Like, it's, Well, no, the middle schoolers are like, oh, that's for kids. But once they get to high school, they're like, haha, we're going to have fun. Participation has changed. Uh and it's become more embraced and there's more people like working and you know doing stuff with cosplay and costuming and things like that so there's a lot of different ground to play with the point is without you know using another example your holiday is going to change over time try to consider how different religious observances got added uh fun little stories or trivia being added into the mix is a great way to add to the complexity yeah and then different regions could celebrate it differently like going back to storm giants and uh gnomes both be potentially following the same knowledge god they live in different terrains so maybe they each celebrate the uh holidays separately all right so before we go um we got one more little chestnut to crack and it is one of my favorite points of contention that frequently comes up in the forums, or it's um, an argument that I see a lot of people my have. My favorite thing from old school cleric that they mostly got aware, got rid of in 5e, outside of saying DM runs everything. Get it. Stripping away the powers of your cleric for not following their god. So, in 5th edition, um, we do not have, even, um, although I'm going to say... Because I played a lot of three five too, there wasn't really rules for taking away powers from clerics in three five either. This was more of a first second edition thing, if I'm remembering correctly. I think they still had it in third, but changed it or got rid of it in three five, or it's somewhere in three five where they have seventy six books, if I remember right. Yeah, they have a lot. So there is a there's a gray area in fifth edition where. They say nothing about losing your powers, but if we look at what a cleric is supposed to be, they are literally supposed to be a living interpretation of the ideals of a certain god. Or they're at least supposed to be close enough, but still believe in those tenets. Well, as a, you know, trope usually goes, what happens when, you know, the priest loses faith in God and so on and so forth? The judge drug cleric starts littering and not paying his parking Well, what tickets. happens when the judge dread cleric, you know, realizes, like, hey, that person, you know, did it not out of malice. It was to survive. You know, what if there is a crisis of faith? Um, there's not a whole lot of rules, and I'm going to toe the Paul line on this. Um, don't take powers away from your players without very good reason. Uh, it has to be a pretty radical shift, but even then, have conversations to them, both out of game and then in game as... Uh, Perhaps, you know, other members of their faith, avatars of the god, visions. Um, we didn't even get into that communication between oh. gods and everybody, but mm, try to tag it on here at the end. Uh, you know, however your god communicates with you, is it visions? Is it uh, something, you know, do you see stuff in the clouds? Is it in your dreams? Or back to earlier, are they actually coming out and walking there does, among you? Does Thor just land in front of you? Hey, buddy. Oh, hi there, son of the All-Father, uh, maker of thunderstorms and whatnot. How you doing? But I need you to go do this. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Takes off. Um, you know, figure out how they communicate. Forgot to mention that earlier. My bad. Uh, but when it comes to stripping power, do it very, 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 very much at, like, it needs to happen. Like, here, I'll I'll, I'll give some examples. So let's say you're playing a Grave Domain Cleric. Their whole spiel is anti-undead. Well, they lose someone, they want to bring them back to life, and they start messing with necromancy. 
um, that would be a good reason to lose your powers. Another good reason I can think of, too, would be maybe, you know, they've been chasing a vampire, and the vampire actually has a very good reason for being a bit of a chotch. And the Grave Domain Cleric actually sees the vampire side of things. You know, other reasons for that. But there, if... Then a- your pacifist life god, that, and then the cleric decides, hey, I'm going to start massacring... Yeah, I wouldn't say things that are that extreme, but well, it, it, a little bit far, shorter on the scale. A l- little bit shorter, but like that's a general, like, a, hey, a general idea. you should lose your powers. Yes, when they do something that is clearly just a violation of ethics, character, and, you know, something they would never do, then, yes, consider either stripping their powers or maybe having a spell or two fail. Uh, that's actually something they did very successfully in... Uh, what is the book? The book is Arthas. It's about the Lich King from World of Warcraft. And it talks about as he was doing the Sundering, uh, where, you know, long story short, he killed an entire town because they ate the grain that was going to turn him into zombie. And he's like, well, can't have no one dead walking around. So he's just walking around killing women and children. And then he turned from Paladin to Lich King. Well, that came later, but like halfway but, yeah. through, he started losing his powers. He was like, hey, there's no, I got no God juice in this hammer right now. What's What's going on? Consider, you know, losing the powers a little bit or, you know, a couple of spells maybe not working. Like, giving them some subtle hints. Like, hey, you're going down a road that doesn't work. Um, stripping their powers if they do something that is in Very the Very extreme. Yeah, but uh, just as an aside, please, as a DM, never, ever look to just take powers away from your player. They have to have been heading down that road for a while. And you should also give them a couple of warning tips before, you know, you finally just pull the trigger on them. Uh, Let's see. Then you could also have another god say, hey, you know what? I like that. I'm going to steal you. Make a deal. All right. Final bit for the day. The old chestnut of the atheist cleric. Um, There is a thing online. I believe it's called. uh, We'll we'll drop it in our show notes uh, on Facebook. Take a look at that if you're ever looking for an atheist way of playing playing a cleric. It's the best one I found online. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head right now. Uh, otherwise, though, I'm just going to hit the stuff I always say whenever someone's like, well, can I play an atheist cleric? Well, no, because you're in a setting where there are literally 15 gods who do things all the time. Like, I can understand atheists in the real world because, you know, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. We don't really know. There's faith and all that wonderful stuff, but... In D and D, they all like they they do shit. So that's the bit on atheists. Okay, we got to wrap up for the day. If you enjoyed the show, please head to facebook.com and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash three DMs. That's T H R E E D M S. Uh, give us a like, give us a follow. Head to twitter.com. Uh, we are at three underscore DM S D M S underscore pod uh follow us there i've getting i've been getting better about my tweeting um uh, we're gonna make an instagram soon and once i get a nice little space in my apartment set up for me to do five minute you know little clip shows we're gonna do an instagram soon um i think we're gonna have nacho back for probably our next show we'll see you in a couple of weeks guys we gotta wrap up we got people coming in for the next show uh have a happy holiday and we'll see y'all in 2019 we out And that's the news. Bye-bye.